by dissimulating a radio frequency cavity. And actually, this is part of a tutorial that was presented in KEK. Uh, so to access the content of this, you have to go to the MoFlow website. You go to Documents. And under MoFlow documentation, you can find this tutorial. It's called KEK Seminar on the 26th of November 2014. So to start with this, you have to download the STL file, which you will find is here. And also, like you can see, a small introductory uh, presentation that I gave. And if you look at the picture, so basically we've got a theoretical uh, RF cavity and we will be doing a simplified vacuum simulation. We will not be doing the CAD modeling today for which I used Autodesk Inventor, but the STL file is available, so the geometry will be available for you and we will do a simple R uh, pressure calculation. So what you do first is you open the geometry uh, we will use this rf3.stl that you have downloaded. And the STL file is actually a mesh of triangles described by coordinates. And the STL file doesn't contain the dimensions, so that's why you uh, have to choose which units you will be using. So this file was saved in millimeters. Now, on the upper right corner, if I turn off the volume view and I rotate the geometry with the right mouse button, then you can see that we have imported actually a mesh of triangles. Now it's easier to work with uh, collapsed triangles. So if I click the collapse button, you can see that there were some changes. For example, the end caps have been converted from a mesh of triangles to circles, which are easier to work with. Also, you can see that originally it has 30,000 vertices and 10,000 facets, and now it has been reduced to 8.5 thousand and 5 thousand vertex. So here we have the geometry, and in our hypothetical uh, way, we will be getting some gas load coming from the uh, walls of it. Obviously, this is like simplifying reality, but I will just select these parts, the RF cavities, Let's say that we've got a thermal outgassing coming from the wall. So uh, for thermal outgassing, here on the right side, I can set up which particle, what particles are coming in and what particles are going out. Typically, particles going out will be pumps. I will set up, set them up next. But now we'd like to get some outgassing. Now thermal outgassing uh, obeys the cosine low, so it's being emitted as a Lambertian emitter, so we use this cosine as a directional distribution. And here I have two options. Either I can give an absolute value for outgassing for each facet, or I can use the area-wise specific outgassing. So without knowing an exact detail of the copper, I will just give a more or less realistic value of 10 to the minus 12 millibars times liters per second per square centimeters and outgassing. Uh, every time you make a parameter change in MoFlow, don't forget to click apply to save those values. Now if you click on any of the facets that you have just set up, you can see that the outgassing per area is always 10 to the minus 12 and the absolute outgassing depends on the area of the facet. So, so far we've got outgassing, but we'd also like to set up the pumps. So for the pumps, I will do a multi-selection. So I have, okay, let's start with the ion pump to deliberately insert. Here I can either write a pumping speed or a sticking factor. You can see what gas we are operating with if you click on this simulation button. Right now we got nitrogen equivalent, so I will leave it like that. And knowing this, and knowing the temperature of the facet, which is room temperature by default, you can set a pumping speed. Now you can see that if your sticking probability would be 1, then the pumping speed would be 324 liters per second. So let's put 300, which is like a realistic pump, something that you can uh, buy, uh, which exists. It will be typically a turbo molecular pump. I click apply. Also, if this is an element in the accelerator, we can assume that uh, the accelerator itself is acting as a pump. So if I put a small sticking factor, like 0.1, it means that uh, 
the, the RF cavity is more or less keeping equilibrium with the rest of the system, but 10% of the molecules that leave the system towards the accelerator get pumped somewhere else, so I will just set it up. So basically when you do a simulation in MoFlow, that's all you need to do. So now we have defined where the gas is coming from, where the gas is going to, and I can just turn on begin. Now, not much is happening, but you can see that actually uh, molecules are being generated here on the desorption line, and there are like about 1 million hits every second that are calculated. Here, on the lower right corner, you can see that many facets, they are receiving hits. But to visualize what's really going on, it's best to turn on the line display. So now these green lines, they represent the trajectory of the molecules. And you can see that the simulation is actually uh, going on. I can even stop it here. And as I click on one facet, I can actually read what's the pressure on that facet by clicking on the details button. Actually, why not even select more? So now I've got a list of the selected facets. And I can go to the column which represents the pressure. Here it is. So we've got like 5 to the 10 to the minus 11 millibars there. So already we have made a, a Moflow simulation. And I will just save it up to uh, be as a reference. So I will just call it rfsim.zip. But we could actually visualize the results. And for that, first I will do it the lazy way. I will just simply uh, select everything. And I will add textures, which are color maps to the geometry. For that, here I don't have more space for uh, these options of the facet. So I have like an advanced facet options window. So what I will do is I will enable a texture. Then I have to decide what I want to count. I want to count the reflection on the wall, which represents the pressure. And for the resolution, I will do it by trial and error. First, I try a resolution of one cell per centimeter. And MoFlow calculates that this would result in about 50,000 uh, cells. Now, if I would put 10, then I would get like 3 million cells, which is maybe a bit too much. Let's try something like 3. I mean, it's not excessive. 300,000 uh, cells and 35 megabytes of memory is more or less okay. So now it's doing a meshing. I can turn on the display view. I start the simulation again. And right now we can see that actually the system is starting to uh, calculate the pressure. I can even switch to volume view and then we can see how the pressure is being distributed. To know what the colors actually mean, you can go to Tools and Texture Scaling, or Ctrl-D. And now you can see that uh, green color, as I'm moving my mouse on the left side, you can see it's about 5 to the minus 11. You have other options, like you can see black and white, where the luminosity corresponds to the texture. Or you can go to Logarithmic Scale to show big pressure differences. For example, here on the pump, obviously, we have very low pressure. And also you can switch what you want to see. You can see the impingement rate, the particle density. Here I need to have a little bit more logarithmic scale. Normally these are all linearly related to each other in this case. When you have uh, systems in multiple temperatures and there will be a difference between these physical units. So, so far I made a pressure simulation. I can see the pressure in my system. Now one remark about textures. Even if we had a lot of memory and a powerful computer, uh, it's not always best to have very small texture elements. You can see that we've got still some statistical scattering. So if I choose a texture resolution here to something much larger, like 10 per centimeter, and I will choose his neighbor to be only one cell per centimeter. We can actually compare it with the rest. So I started the simulation. 
You can see that here I got a very nice detailed texture, however, the statistical scattering is quite huge. However, here, because bigger texture cells automatically mean some averaging, I will get the pressure results quicker. Now, I just started the simulation, so I need to run it also for a few seconds, but you can already see that there is one problem I will just turn off. So here you can see that due to statistical scattering, you got some tiny cells which receive too many hits, and then the auto-scaling is taking them into account. So this is also another uh, argument against using two small texture cells. If auto-scaling is wrong, you can actually change it here in the texture scaling window. I just click on set to current, and then he fills out the minimum and the maximum ball used by those that he estimated. And here I can reduce the maximum to a lower number or even by an order of magnitude or even more. Ah, I was actually uh, counting the minimum, so I made a mistake. Let's go to uh, 1 to the minus 10. The minimum must be 1 to the minus 9. Okay, so this is what I actually wanted to see. Now we can see uh, more uh, pressure distribution, so it's like an even color map. Obviously, we still have the statistical scattering, but here with the lower texture cells, you don't have that anymore. So this is already some result. You could see your system, how it goes. Obviously, you can uh, play around. For example, you could see how your system would behave if you had a small spark coming from here. So I just selected a few cells. And here I uh, increase the outgassing to 10 to the minus 8, for example. Obviously, the pressure is now higher, so I have to uh, turn back auto scaling. Maybe a logarithmic scale is more appropriate. And if you let it calculate, we will see the effect of this. extra outgassing coming from here. Now, you could see that as I'm working with more flow, it's quite slow, and this is because he has to recalculate a large number of textures. So maybe it would be wise to, instead of having a texture on every facet, simply have a longitudinal facet that acts as a counter, and that way we could actually uh, calculate the pressure distribution. So what I will do is I will just select all the facets, and go to selection, select all. I will disable the texture. And I would like to create a long facet that's going along the pipe. To do that, I will actually uh, go to the vertex selection mode. And to create a new facet, I would like to select four vertices, which will be the four corners. So, if I go to the front view, it's a little bit hard to see which is a good choice. For example, I could try uh, these guys here. And probably this would be uh, already a quite okay selection. However, to do this properly, I will select these. Go to the front view. I will actually deselect everything but those which are more or less horizontal. And then I'd like to uh, make a copy of this. So for this, I need to know what the coordinates are. So I will just use vertex, I will use move. And actually, uh, here I can see that the dimensions of my system is about 151.9 centimeters in the Z direction. So I will ask it to go 152 centimeters to the Z. I copy this. That way I can ensure that actually my system is, uh, my new facet is planar. And in the vertex menu, there is a create facet from selected command, which will create me a new facet. Now, this brings up the question that how can you measure dimensions in mole flow if you don't have uh, alignment towards the axis. There is a trick, you can select one of the facets, 
you click on select vertex as base, then you click on another facet, another vertex, you select this, and then Mofo tells you the distance between the two is 152 centimeters. This is also a, a good way to, for example, measure the diameter of a circle. Here I click this vertex, I say select vertex, and then I will try to find the opposite. So for that, I will go to the side view. Yeah, this would be a correct view. I will select this, and then the distance between these two was 26.24 centimeters. Anyway, I'm going back to uh, my faucet, and I have to make uh, several selections. If I turn on the normal vector, you can see that this faucet is pointing downwards, which means that by default it's only catching molecules coming from downwards towards the up. So I will make it two-sided and then he will collect more statistics. We expect pressure to be the same both sides, but if it's two-sided then actually it will catch more molecules. Uh, currently particles would bounce from it, so it would be like a solid ball in the system. However, this will be only a virtual faucet that won't uh, perturbate our system. So we will make it transparent by setting its opacity to zero. And also, we'd like to put some texture on it. This time, instead of counting the reflection, I will count the transparent passes, because it's uh, transparent. And now we can give a pressure a texture. For example, by giving a resolution of 5, I can see that it will have 50,000 cells. Why not? So if I turn on the texture view, Then I can see that mole flow is not so laggy as it was before, it's like pretty fluid. And yet, if I go to the top view, I can see that we've got some pressure distribution being calculated. Now, while it's calculating, uh, we can see uh, some visualization techniques. So, for example, if I turn on the lines, I can see how the particles are flying. If we turn on the volume view, I can see the volume, but now our texture is actually hidden. So how could I make the upper half of the, facet of the RF cavity transparent? For that, I will just select the upper half of my uh, geometry. I will go to the advanced facet view and I will turn off volume drawing. Now, normally when you change a parameter, you click apply, but at that time you have to restart your simulation. This is only a graphical view setting, so if you click on change draw mode, it will update the setting without restarting your simulation. And now you can really see into the system, you could still see the particles flying, and you can see the pressure distribution, and we can also see the effect of this spark that we have created in a previous step. And one final visualization tool, which might be uh, interesting, is uh, selecting this facet, turn off its uh, texture view, and each facet has a U and a V local vectors. So you can see that the U is pointing from this point to that direction. And I can measure the pressure along this line. Now, just as a note, if you say shift indices, then that way you can rotate the U and V directions. So now the U is pointing the other way around. Why not leave it like that? So to turn on a profile, you go to the profile menu and you turn on this pressure along the U vector. I launch the simulation again. I still got my uh, textures, so they are still available. However, there is a new tool called Profile Plotter. And then I can visualize the pressure along that line. So to make the two of them match, match, here you can see that the U is going that way, so I will just rotate the geometry this way. And I will make the plot larger, and now more or less the graph and the geometry are uh, visually aligned. Now, you can actually see that uh, here we've got some dips in the pressure profile, and that's because uh, this 
virtual facade that we have created is slightly larger than the smallest cross-section of our system. So at this point, for example, he's calculating the average of the real pressure inside the system and also this part, which is uh, zero. So actually, for a profile, it would be better if we uh, deleted the profile from this facet. And we created a facet that's actually somewhat smaller and which fits nicely in our RF cavity. For that, I will use the scale command. And this time, I'm taking advantage of the fact that our RF cavity is along the Z line. So I'd like to simply make it X dimensions smaller. So I will do a distorted scaling and I will ask Molfold to create a facet which is half as thick. So right now, since this is a copied facet, it doesn't have the texture anymore. I can still make a profile. I go back to the previous view mode. And I will just put on screen the profile plotter. And this time the dips have disappeared, so now I can actually uh, see the texture and the pressure profile match. Obviously, these tools can go on the clipboard. So, for example, I can quickly make, use an external tool to uh, make a plot out of it. And just in a second, I will just close it to make Excel load faster. So basically, I can paste the data and then I can make a scatter plot to create a plot within a different program. So, scatter plot. And here I've got the same pressure profile as I had in MoFlow before. Also, like you can export textures, for that I will select this. And then there is a tool which is called Texture Plotter. So here I can actually see the texture, I can even select parts of it. And you can see that they are getting highlighted. So when I select this, you can see that uh, that matches this section. I can just copy everything. I will just paste it in a new sheet. In the insert command, I can generate a plot, which will be uh, here in surface plot. So this is a lot of data, so it will be somewhat slow to work with. However, if I go to this 3D rotation tool, then I can actually just change the rotation and I can visualize this pressure map. So with this 3D view. Obviously, there is a lot of statistical scattering, so I would have to run the simulation longer, but this is an example of how you can uh, export data. And by the way, uh, there is a special export tool. So there is this export selected textures, and you can even ask to uh, export multiple facets, for example, group by coordinates, or even facet by facet. And one final remark is that when I was splitting this geometry in two to uh, make sure that I can see inside, here I still got a few facets which uh, I couldn't select because they go up and down. So if I really wanted to make a correct selection, then what I could do is uh, select everything. So I just select all facets. And then I ask Moleflow to split the geometry by the, in this case, XZ plane. And now, if I go to the front view, I can nicely select everything that was over the plane. I can ask them to be invisible. All the rest, by inverting the selection, will be visible. And this time, it's like a correct cut where you can really see inside the system. 
So finally, as I'm ready, I will just save the solution as rf cavity solve.zip. 